Welcome to the first BAA Ordinary Meeting of 2021, which we are again holding as a webinar due to the coronavirus restrictions. This is being held on Zoom and live streamed to YouTube. The webinar is being recorded and it will be available to watch on our YouTube channel a few hours after the meeting. You can ask questions by typing into Q&A on Zoom at the bottom of the screen or in the comments on YouTube and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. It's my pleasure to hand over to Alan Lorraine, the president of the BAA. Thank you very much indeed, Andy, and uh, welcome to, uh, to everybody this afternoon, um, both to uh, BAA members and also to those uh, joining us on YouTube as well. Um, obviously, as Andy indicated already, that um, this uh, was to be our first face-to-face -face meeting of 2021, um, which has been replaced by the webinar. Um, we're continuing to do that. We have our weekly webinars on Wednesday evening, um, details on, the, on our website, um, but also for our main meetings. Um, whilst we aren't able to meet in person, then we're replacing them by these, uh, these meetings uh, virtually on Saturday. Um, we're continually updating the, or considering the uh, situation, and uh, we discussed at Council this morning the, the chances to return to face-to-face uh, -to -face meetings. Uh, and the hope is that um, for September, potentially in Leeds, that uh, we will have a, a, our first face-to-face -face meeting, or if the uh, legislation and the uh, situation won't allow it, then uh, hopeful for the uh, return for the annual general meeting, which will be held at the uh, IOP uh, in London. So what I'd like to do now um, is to introduce our, our speaker this afternoon, uh, uh, Dr. Anne Bernal. Um, and is the president of the Leicester Astronomical Society and has done numerous um, talks to local societies throughout the, the country um, over many years. Now, Anne is a, a, a chemist by profession and uh, the uh, biography that I've been given sort of says that uh, she once worked in a chemical department, uh, chemical, um, Department of a University overseas some many moons ago, and uh, that university is perhaps uh, better known than it was at the time, um, because that was in the University of Wuhan in, in China. Um, I think was it was 365 days on from when the, uh, the lockdown started in Wuhan. Anyway, um, what I'd like to do is to introduce Anne to you. So her talk, uh, Now You See It, Now You Don't. Um, can I pass you over to, uh, to Anne, if I may? Okay, thank you very much uh, for that uh, introduction, Alan. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you uh, uh, this afternoon. Um, yes, the talk is called uh, Now You See It, Now You Don't. And I'm going to start sharing my screen with you, hopefully. Um, Right, is... Yep, that's looking good. Good, okay. Just trying to get the slideshow going now. There we are. Yeah, right. that's Can all working. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, right. you went a little bit or just for that moment then, but yes, you're, you're sounding okay. Everything's coming Super. through. Super, that, that, that's great then, thank you. Right. Um, well, this, in this afternoon's uh, talk, um, I'm not going to present any sort of groundbreaking stock press original sort of research to you. I'm not going to announce to you that I've discovered a planet that uh, no one else has seen before. It's simply a review of instances when people think they have found something, but it turns out doesn't actually exist. And I'm sure that from time to time, most people have seen something a bit odd when you've been out there looking at the sky, you know, as a one-off and then just dismissed it. There's no sort of reasonable explanation for it but some people have sort of made a habit of this. And this afternoon, I'm going to tell you about some of the hypothetical objects that people believe they have seen, but it turns out that they don't actually exist. So um, this must be one of the few instances of an astronomical talk where I'm just talking about things that you have no chance of seeing. So we're talking about these hypothetical solar system objects, and we can have a definition of this, it's a planet, natural satellite, or similar body in our solar system whose existence is not known, but somehow it's been inferred 
from observational scientific evidence. People have been out there, think they've seen something and then taken it uh, from there. And I'm going to start off with um, perhaps a very well-known um, object Vulcan. Not that one, you Star Trek fans. Um, this is a Vulcan that um, was purported to um, exist in our solar system. So why did people think that there was this planet between Mercury and the Sun? Well, by the 19th century, the orbit of Mercury had become a bit of a thorn in the side of astronomers for quite some time. Mercury wasn't behaving as they had um, predicted by looking at um, the way perhaps it inter interacted gravitationally with the other planets and by applying Newton's laws of motion. And various minds have looked into the problem. And what's happening is that Mercury does not retrace the same path each time it goes around the sun. Um, but its point of closest approach to the sun, perihelion, of course, um, swings around over time. The perihelion advances. I'm sure a lot of people uh, you know, know this anyway. And obviously in this diagram, the amount of the advance is greatly exaggerated. In actual fact, the actual advance is only about 43 seconds per century. But, but astronomers were aware that it was doing this. But why? Now, in the in the 1840s, Francoise Arago, who worked sometime at the Paris Observatory and was a sort of sometime French politician as well, he suggested to the very notable uh, mathematician Urbain Le Verrier that he look into the problem. And Le Verrier was actually a mathematician rather than an observational astronomer. So this is how all this started. And in 1843, Le Verrier published his report, uh, first report on the motion of Mercury. And um, the English translation of the title is A New Determination of the Orbit of Mercury and Its Perturbations. So he published the report. He's got some predictions in there for the um, path of Mercury. So it needs testing. And there was a transit of Mercury across the sun coming up in 1845. And that was viewed from the US. So there were observers in the US watching this transit and from Le Verrier's work they've been able to calculate some predictions as to when the transit would start but Mercury didn't appear it was a few seconds late so there was obviously something not quite right with Le Verrier's work so the predictions failed to match the observations and I think there was another transit about three years later which was observed from Europe um, so again um, obviously Mercury didn't behave itself so it's back to the drawing board then for Le Verrier. But of course, in the interim, he'd, um, his calculations had been used in the discovery of another, this time a real planet, Neptune. He'd calculated a position for it based upon its perturbation of Uranus. And, you know, like um, he was trying to do with uh, Mercury, um, Le Verrier was looking into um, how Uranus was moving around, interactions of Uranus with the other planets and this unknown planet, and using Newton's uh, work as well. So he got some sort of pedigree in this, I think it's fair to say. So undeterred by his uh, seemingly um, fail, failure with uh, Mercury, he carried on. And some years later, in 1859, he carried out a more in-depth study of the motions of Mercury. And it still didn't match up with the observations, unfortunately. So it, it now was clear to him that this, this slow procession of Mercury's orbit around the sun couldn't be explained completely by applying Newtonian mechanics and gravitational interactions with the known planets at the time. So what, what was going on? What else could be uh, a possible reason for this? Well, if you've discovered one planet, why not have a go at seeing if you can discover another? So Le Verrier suggested that the um, peculiarities in the orbit of Mercury could be explained by the presence of an intra-mercurial planet, 
or maybe several smaller bodies. He didn't dismiss that fact. He called them corpuscles. Now, he certainly wasn't the first person to wonder if there was a planet between Mercury and the Sun. Once the um, asteroids had been discovered at the start of the 19th century, then you know people were wondering, well, where else in the solar system might there be undiscovered bodies? So, as I said, he wasn't the first to propose um, a body between Mercury and the Sun, but he was the first to put forward some sort of mathematical justification for this. And there seems to be some debate as to um, whether he was the first person to call it Vulcan or not. And I mean, it's an apt name anyway. Vulcan is the Roman god of fire, including volcanoes. Um, but I think other people had had that idea before him because this uh, diagram here comes from, uh, I think it's a textbook, uh, round about 1846, this is dated. And that clearly has a planet called Vulcan on it between the Sun and Mercury. So um, I think it was a name that was in general uh, circulation. So because um, Le Verrier had proposed this planet, then as I said, his reputation went before him. Um, so the suggestion of a planet between the Sun and Mercury was taken extremely seriously. And all that was needed now was for someone to go out and find it. Um, and the best opportunities, of course, um, would be when um, there was the planet was in transit across the sun or when there was a total solar eclipse. Because, you know, I mean, it's difficult enough, you know, observing Mercury, but Vulcan would be even closer in. And, um, you know, they'd be looking for a transit. This is actually a transit of, uh, of Mercury, the picture there. So it was recognised it would be difficult. And it was also recognised that it could be quite a long, drawn-out process before the existence of Vulcan could be confirmed. Um, if the planet's going to transit across the uh, sun, then they need some sort of prediction as to um, its possible orbit. And they didn't have that when Le Verrier uh, first made this announcement. So nice total solar eclipse there. Please carry on. And I think you can imagine the excitement when on the 22nd of December, 1859, Le Verrier receives a letter from a country doctor who also happened to be an amateur astronomer. And this is Dr. Edmund Modeste Lescarbo. There's a, a picture of him there, he looks rather smartly dressed, doesn't he? Lescarbo lived in a village called auger en beauce which is about 70 kilometers southwest of Paris. He'd been observing the sun on and off for about 20 years. He was one of these people that was hoping that he was going to be able to discover one of these new unknown bodies in the solar system. But he also had some interest in sunspots. Now, what had happened is that earlier on that year, on the 26th of March, he noticed a, a black dot on the, uh, the disk of the sun and he used a 95 millimeter uh, refractor. Uh, that was his observatory now. Now, it was either his observatory or his house that uh, some years later burnt down. But uh, anyway, that was where he was um, observing from. So he's he seen this black dot on the, the disk of the sun. And at first he thought it was a sunspot. Okay. So he didn't take too much notice. But after some time, he noticed that it was slowly moving across the sun. Now, he pre previously observed um, a transit of Mercury. So he assumed that what he was witnessing was the transit of a previously unknown body. So he made some measurements of its position and its direction of motion. Now, he wasn't using terribly sophisticated equipment to do this. He used an old clock. And he used a pendulum, which he often used to take his patients' pulses with. And he was able to come up with a transit time of one hour, 17 minutes and nine seconds. Okay. Oh. There we are. Yeah. And um, obviously the black dot, um, it would probably look you know, something like that. I mean, this is actually a transit of Venus uh, photograph from 1882, but... Um, um, and, you know, the black dot of uh, Vulcan, supposedly, um, you know, would have been a lot smaller than that. 
But anyway, there was a, there was a black dot there. Now, he didn't, he kept his discovery to himself, uh, you know, for a while because he was hoping that he'd be able to make a confirmatory observation. Well, this, of course, didn't happen. And it was some time before he got to hear about the Verrier's um, announcement um, about this potential planet between Mercury and the Sun. And so when he heard about that, he thought, well, maybe this is it. And he wrote to Le Verrier. Now, when Le Verrier got the letter, he was both sort of excited and suspicious. And he thought, well, I need to go and see Le Verrier, um, sorry, Lescarbo myself. And it was actually on the 31st of December, 1859, that Le Verrier visited Lescarbo. He'd got the letter on the 22nd of December. And, you know, he had to sort a few things out, you know, Christmas was, was happening. And he needed to get there as soon as possible. And he decided that he would go and visit Lescarbo unannounced. He didn't want to give Lescarbo the opportunity to prepare himself in any way at all for his visit. He wanted to just sort of catch him and see what these uh, claims were. Um, when Le Verrier went, he took a, a Monsieur Valet with him, who was the Honorary Inspector General of Roads and Bridges. He wanted a witness there. And so they caught the train to Orgères on the 31st of December. I think they had to do the last few miles of the journey on foot. But they calculated that they would be able to get back to Paris by midnight on the 31st of December, uh, because Le Verrier was due to go to his father-in-law's the next day, uh, for a New Year's Day celebration, and he didn't miss that. So, Le Verrier turns up to see Lescarbo completely uh, un unannounced, okay? And um, when he got there, as I said, he didn't, um, he just wanted to sort of catch him as he was, so obviously Lescarbo was a bit uh, surprised. But Le Verrier went there, he didn't go there thinking, oh, this is Vulcan. He was going there with a fairly open mind, but nevertheless, he needed to make sure that this was the evidence he was after. He wasn't just going to latch on at any particular discovery. And when he met um, Lescarbo, essentially the first thing he said to him was, this is probably paraphrasing, um, but he said, it is then you, sir, who pretend to have observed the intramercurial planet and who have committed the grave offence of keeping the observation secret for nine months. I warn you that I have come here with the intention of doing justice to your pretension and of demonstrating either that you have been dishonest or deceived. So I think, you know, Le Verrier was uh, laying down the, uh, the, the rules to uh, Scarbo, what uh, he was looking for. He couldn't pull the wool over his eyes. Sorry. Right, so what happened then? Well, they sat down um, together and Lescarbo gave Le Verrier a full description of the instruments that he'd used. Um, his chronometer was a huge pocket watch with only hour and minute hands. And he counted the seconds with the aid of really, I think what must have been a sort of homemade pendulum, which consisted of an ivory ball attached to a silk thread with a nail um, attaching it to the wall. And, you know, seeing such sort of basic stuff, it's no wonder that the Verrier began to suspect that the whole affair was an imposition or a delusion. And these suspicions seem to be taken a bit further when Lescarbo couldn't actually produce his notebook. Um, when he actually did manage to find it, and as I said, I think that's fair enough because um, he uh, hadn't been given full warning of this uh, visit. Um, it was uh, covered with grease and laudanum. Okay? Um, but and Lascarbo, um, I think when he when he was doing his sort of calculations in his um, observatory, often he didn't have paper to hand. He used to scribble readings and observations down on a uh, piece of wood, and if he needed to erase them, apparently he was just planing the wood to get rid of them. So it wasn't exactly your sort of professional um, setup. But by talking to him and looking at the um, observations, Le Verrier became convinced that the scar boat really had seen Vulcan. So um, he went back to 
Paris, and on the 2nd of January, 1860, so a couple of days after he'd uh, seen the Scarbo, Le Verrier announced the discovery of Vulcan to the world. So obviously people were very excited by this, and Le Scarbo uh, eventually was made a sort of companion of the Légion d'honneur for his part in this um, discovery. So it's all looking good. But not everyone was convinced. Um, this um, Emmanuel Lias, he was a French astronomer who'd spent some time in Brazil. He'd actually worked with Le Verrier at one time, and the two had had a bit of a spat. So he wasn't necessarily going to be... He'd been studying the sun at the same time as uh, Lescarbo saw Vulcan. And he said that I'm in a condition to deny in the most positive manner, the passage of a planet over the sun at the time indicated. And couldn't actually find a picture of him, but there's a bust of him. So. Well, Le Verrier carried on. And on the basis of Le Starbo's transit, Le Verrier was able to make some calculations about Vulcan's orbit. He said that Vulcan has a nearly circular orbit um, and its distance would be 20, work out 21 million kilometers from the sun. The orbital period is 19 days and 17 hours. The inclination to the ecliptic is 12 degrees and 10 minutes. And he calculated that as seen from the earth, Vulcan's greatest elongation from the sun would be eight degrees. So it would be extremely tight trying to uh, find it, of course. But you know, he's made these um, calculations, but we need other observations to back this up. So, but then once this discovery was announced, the floodgates opened and many reports began to reach Le Verrier, all of which actually turned out to be uh, unreliable. Um, some of them had been observations that were made many years earlier. Many of them weren't properly dated. But the Verrier continued to refine his calculations based on the one observation that he'd got from Escarbo. And on the basis of these, he was able to announce future transit. But unfortunately, they failed to materialise. But um, he carried on doing his, um, his calculations. But there were some observations that had, were made by some reputable observers, shall we say. So you know, between 1860, when he first made the discovery, and then 1865, there were these ones that came in that weren't really, he wasn't too happy about. But some more reliable observations, i.e. they were made by reputable observers, were made during a total solar eclipse of the 29th of July, 1878, which was visible from the, uh, the US. And these were done by James Craig Watson and Lewis Swift. Um, they were working different, in, independently, they were working, observing the eclipse from different sites. And they went to look at this eclipse, not so much because they wanted to see the eclipse, but they wanted to see if they could make some observations of Vulcan. And, ooh, looks like they hit the jackpot, because both of them reported seeing what they described as a sort of Vulcan-type planet close to the sun. In fact, Watson thought he could see two um, previously unidentified objects uh, close to the sun. Um, you know, they're described as red and disc-like. This is uh, Lewis Swift here, and of course he is the Swift of uh, comet fame. So you can see what I mean by um, a reputable observer. And this is uh, James Craig Watson, who was Professor of Astronomy at the University of Michigan. Now, so this is looking good. We've got some Vulcan type objects close to the sun. But Swift and Watson's Vulcans didn't match up with Le Verrier's. And Le Verrier had died the previous year. And with him, you know, pretty much the search for Vulcan um, abated. There were, you know, a few other attempts. And, you know, probably Swift and Watson, they've been planning this for some time. So they were going to go ahead and, and do it, but um, it's um, it was it was not to be. It wasn't Vulcan, and we now know, of course, that um, 
you know, the beginning of the, the 20th century, Einstein's work, that predicts exactly the orbit of Mercury without having to invoke the existence of um, Vulcan. And I'm sure there are people out there who know far more about Einstein and um, the orbit of Mercury than I do. So that's all I'm going to say on it, I think. So, um, as I said, a lot of people abandoned the search for Vulcan um, round about the time that Le Verrier died. But once Einstein um, had um, been able to explain this, then that was it. If you like, Vulcan was uh, uh, dead in the water, so to speak. However, though, every so often, like a lot of these um, discoveries, things rear their head, don't they? During the 1970 eclipse of the sun, um, this man here, Henry Corton, who worked at Dowling College, New York, he found several objects which appeared to be close to the sun in some plates that he'd uh, produced for the 1970 eclipse. And from these, he was able to work out the size and um, the diameter of the orbit. And he would got other um, images that led him to propose the existence of an asteroid belt. Oh, well, that's interesting, between Mercury and the sun. But none of these claims have been substantiated. Um, you know, so what were these objects he was seeing? What were the objects that uh, Watson Swift was seeing? Well, we don't know after all this length of time. Might have been a small asteroid. It could have been um, previously unknown comets. But what about this asteroid belt then between Mercury and the Sun? Well, again, this is hypothetical. And of course, they've been given a name, the Vulcanoids. People have done predictions that um, it might be possible for small bodies to exist in stable orbits uh, between Mercury and the Sun, but none have been discovered. People have looked for them, but again, you're up against the same sort of barriers you do, um, you, you come across when you're looking for, say, something like Vulcan. The proximity to the Sun makes it incredibly difficult. Um, but you know, nowadays, um, we've got the advantage of being, a being able to use satellites and um, you know, particularly, you know, when Messenger was at Mercury, um, amongst other things, it did look to see if it could find um, some other objects between Mercury and the Sun, but none were found. And, um, you know, searches have occasionally continued at eclipses. So it's a no to Vulcan, I'm afraid, and a no to the Vulcanoids. But one good thing that came out of the search for Vulcan, it's often the case, isn't it, that uh, you know you start going down one road looking for something, and then after a while you discover something else, something unrelated. Uh, I'm sure this is a name that's well known to uh, uh, many people. He was interested in trying to discover um, an unknown planet, and he observed the sun every day, you know, for a good many years. Um, and kept a very careful record of what he'd seen. He didn't find Vulcan, so sorry, bit of a spoiler alert there, but he did notice a regular variation in the sunspot numbers. And he reckoned that it was an approximately 10 year period. So all you uh, sunspot um, observers out there, um, well, I like to think that you've got Vulcan to uh, thank uh, for this, uh, ultimately, if you chase it back far enough, okay? We've got to uh, give, keep some sort of praise on Vulcan. Now, we're still on Mercury, I'm afraid. Um, well, no, it's an interesting planet, isn't it? But what about the moon? Does Mercury have a moon? Well, we all know the answer to that. But it does appear that back in March 1974, uh, there were a few days when people were really scratching their heads about the possibility of a moon going around Mercury. Um, on, um, in March 1974, the Mariner 10 spacecraft was in the vicinity of, of Mercury. Um, it flew past it on the 29th of March, but two days beforehand, um, one of its instruments began to register bright emissions in the um, extreme ultraviolet that in the words of one of the um, researchers, they said it had no right to be there. But the next day it had gone. Okay. But three days later it reappeared and the object, the source, 
appeared to have sort of detached itself from Mercury. So what on earth was, was going on? Um, at first, the astronomers thought they'd seen a star, uh, but they'd seen it, you know, looking in two quite different directions. And every astronomer knew that these extreme ultraviolet wavelengths couldn't penetrate very far through the interstellar medium. So, you know, couldn't possibly be a star. Was it a moon? Did Mercury have a moon? And what they were able to uh, do was they were able to calculate um, the speed for which this object seemed to be uh, moving in relation to uh, Mercury. And it, they came up with a figure of about four kilometers per second. So that might be consistent with the, um, the speed of a moon. And the, um, the, the trouble is, though, that um, I think the following day they were due to have a sort of press conference and there were some very worried uh, JPL managers, um, you know, called in. How, how were they going to deal with this? Because at the press conference, should they possibly announce that Mercury had a moon? And apparently some of the press had already picked up on this. Um, some of the apparently the bigger, more respectable papers, I think this was in the US, played it straight. But of course, um, there's always the, um, the more excited papers that sort of started to run a story about Mercury's new moon. Well, of course, it wasn't a moon. It headed straight out from Mercury. And eventually it was, was identified as a hot star, 31 criteria. Okay? And quite where the emissions, the original emissions came from, the ones that were spotted on the approach to the planet, well, no one knows. It, it's a bit of a mystery. But again, it's a bit like with Schwaber and the, uh, the sunspots. Um, this observation did give rise to an important discovery in astronomy that the ultraviolet radiation can actually get through the interstellar medium much further than uh, you know people had thought. So uh, again, something sort of positive came out of this. So no moons for um, Mercury and Messenger, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, that's also looked, you know, though in careful examination of all the data there hasn't shown any evidence for a Mercurian moon. But what about Venus? Well, um, this moon of, of Venus was so convinced with people that um, it existed. I mean, you either see it spelt like that or with an E on the end. And one of the, um, I think one of the first observations of this was by Cassini back in 1672. He was observing Venus and he noticed a small companion close to it. So, you know, he was thinking, well, does Venus have a satellite? But he decided not to sort of announce his observation or publish it in any way. But 14 years later, in 1686, he saw the same object again. And then he put it down in his journal. And, um, you know, word did, you know, get around. He estimated that the object had about a quarter of the diameter of Venus and showed the same phase as Venus. Um, and later, the object was seen by quite a few others as well. Um, I mean, we're talking quite some time afterwards, aren't we? 1761, as opposed to 1686. Um, but you know, people reported seeing that 18 times during 1761 by five observers. But in the intervening period, um, other, you know, quite noted people had seen it as well. So maybe it, it did exist. And there's this drawing here by uh, Francesco Fontana of um, Venus and its so-called moon. But I think there's something wrong with, um, you know, Fontana's um, instrument that he was using, because I think I've read somewhere that he did... Um, you know, drawings of Mars as well that seem to show this sort of, you know, black dot. So maybe we won't take that too um, seriously. Now, so what's, what's going on with Venus? Well, a transit. 1761. Um, some observers, um, this was the transit of the 6th of June, 1761. Um, some observers reported seeing a small spot following Venus across the face of the sun. Well, surely that must be the satellite. Um, but others watching the same transit, they didn't see the companion spot. 
And in 1764, apparently there were eight observations by two observers, but many others failed to see it. So what on earth was, was going on? Some people can see it, some people can't. Well, 1766, the rather unfortunately named Father Held of the um, Vienna Observatory, rather, um, he got down to, you know, the, the sort of gist of this, I suppose. He said that he published a treatise in which he said that all observations of the satellite were optical illusions. He said Venus is so bright that what's happening is that it's reflecting back into your eye, uh, it's reflecting into your eye back into the telescope and creating a secondary image uh, on a smaller scale. End of story. But you no, know, not everyone was convinced, and you know some people did carry on. Um, publishing observations of this so-called moon of Venus. Um, but we now know that, of course, it doesn't have one. And again, you know, spacecraft have been there. There is no evidence for a moon around Venus. However, interesting postscript to this. Um, a couple of things. Um, all right, if what people were saying then wasn't a moon, what could it be? Well, Jean-Charles Cuso, who um, at one time had worked at the Royal Observatory in Brussels, but he actually got the sack from there. He was asked to leave um, because of his political opinions. I'm not quite sure exactly what they were. And he ended up working in the United States for a while as a journalist and at an observatory. But eventually he got invited back to uh, Brussels. He came up with another explanation. He said, it's not a moon. What we're seeing is yet another planet. And he, uh, in 1884, he said that um, these observations could be put down to a planet that orbits the sun every 283 days and is in conjunction with Venus once every 1,080 days or nearly every three years. So that was his contribution, which, again, I don't think was taken um, too seriously. But maybe it was um, perhaps out of embarrassment that um, perhaps the Belgian Academy of Sciences, they decided to look into this once and for all. So they got hold of as many of the observations of Venus and its moon as they could. And they concluded that quite a few of the observations of this so-called moon were of stars that were in the vicinity of Venus. And these are some of the uh, candidate um, stars that they identified as being uh, possible observations of the moon. But, there's always a but in this, um, in 1892, obviously one of the greatest observers of all time, um, Edward Barnard, he reported seeing a seventh magnitude object near Venus. Now, there was no star in that position, and Barnard, as we all know, was an excellent observer, and he had previously searched for the moon of Venus and found nothing. So what did Barnard see? Uh, maybe it was an asteroid, asteroid rather, maybe a short-lived nova. We'll never know, but it certainly wasn't a moon. So, you know, it just does go to show that even, you know, the best observers, sometimes they see things that uh, they can't quite explain. So Mercury has no moons, Venus has no moons, the Earth has one, or does it? Does it have a second moon? Well, um, in the 19th century, there were some who thought this. And in 1846, Frederick Petit, who was the director of the Toulouse Observatory, he stated that a second moon of the Earth had been discovered by a couple of his um, assistants at the Toulouse Observatory and by another observer working nearby. And on the um, basis of um, what they'd seen, he was able to uh, work out um, a period for it, two hours, 44 minutes, so whoosh, 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 going around the Earth like that, and its distance varied between 3,570 kilometres and 11.4 kilometres. Now, Le Verrier was in the audience when he made this announcement, and Le Verrier, who wasn't perhaps always the nicest person, he was quite dismissive, and he said, oh, you know, air resistance would have to be taken into account if this moon is swooping that low into the Earth's atmosphere. Um, 
but Tati became obsessed with this um, second moon. And later he announced he'd made calculations about, um, you know, how this moon would influence the uh, perturbations of our own moon. But generally, um, all this was ignored. And I think it's fair to say that the idea would have been forgotten had it not been for this man, Jules Verne. Because um, Jules Verne read about um, Petit's, um, not, not discovery, his announcement, shall we say. And in his book, From the Earth to the Moon, um, three you know, people, three men, you know, go up into um, space on this journey to the, uh, the moon. And um, in the, the book, a small object passes close to their space capsule. And I'll just quote you a tiny bit from the book. Um, one of the uh, space travellers says, it's a small, a simple meteorite, but an enormous one retained as a satellite by the attraction of the Earth. And then one of the other travellers says, is that possible the Earth has two moons? Yes, my friend, it has two moons, although it's usually believed to have only one. But this second moon is so small and its velocity is so great that the inhabitants of Earth see it. It was by noticing disturbances that a French astronomer, Monsieur Putty, so he gets his mention, could determine the existence of this second moon and calculate its orbit. And then he, they spill off some figures there. And then um, the other tra one of the other travellers, do all astronomers admit the existence of this satellite? No, but if like us they admit it, they could no longer doubt it. And then, as I said, there's some um, various figures about the, the moon, which don't agree with those that are put forward by um, uh, you know, by uh, Putty, okay. But the thing is that Jules Verne was read by millions of, of people. And um, I think, you know, as, a, oh, sorry, slides have got a mind of their own. Um, I think this second moon almost gained fact status as a result of Verne and um, another astronomer, which I'll mention in a minute. And many, you know, professional astronomers got really fed up with the um, public ask about this second moon, which is understandable, isn't it? Um, one other person who, um, you know, went down the second moon road uh, was this uh, man from Hamburg, Georg Waltermatt. And in 1897, well, he didn't stick with one moon. He said there was a whole system of tiny moons orbiting the Earth. He was able to give the orbital elements of one of these um, you know, period of 119 days, um, 700 kilometers diameter. And he said sometimes it shines at night like the sun. I must admit, I've never seen that. Um, and um, again, he was able to make predictions for um, eclipses, um, which of course never took place, but um, you know, undeterred, he, uh, he carried on. Um, the um, he continued, as I said, to you know give these um, these predictions, and um, there was one um, he predicted that a transit would occur of one of these moons across the sun. I mean, it's so small it wouldn't fully eclipse it, um, and he'd got some people watching for it, and of course they described how they could see this object pass across the disk of the sun, but there were professional astronomers trying to observe it from Austria. And they didn't see anything. Okay. So, and that's his announcement, you know, second moon of the Earth. Now, this object here does exist. Sometimes people refer to this as the Earth's um, second moon. Obviously, it's it's not. It's an object called, um, you know, Charisne, um, which is actually an orb, an asteroid rather that's in a sort of like one-to-one -one orbital resonance with the Earth. Its orbit is offset from that of the Earth. Um, Charisne comes in a, you know, closer than Mercury and goes out further than Mars, um, I, I believe. Um, but its orbital period is about one year, but sometimes people do describe this as a moon. It's not. It's obviously orbiting the sun. But as I said, that, that does exist. Um, there. Um, just very quickly, well, what else is there? Well, uh, well not is there, could possibly be there. Uh, there's Taike, hypothetical gas giant in the Oort cloud, just was proposed about 20 years ago. Um, Matesi was studying the orbits of um, comets. 
you know, coming in from the Oort cloud, these long period comets, and he seemed to think, well, that there was a bias in that, that orbit, okay? They were being affected by some unseen object, and he's proposed that this object is about 15,000 astronomical units out, so roughly, you know, a few hundred times the distance of Neptune. It takes 1.8 million years to go round the sun, four times the mass of Jupiter. So, you know, way out here somewhere. And people have looked for it, NASA's WISE probe. It's ruled out the existence of a body the size of Taike within the parameters that Matisse put on it. So, sadly not. Um, other moons of Saturn, um, Themis was a um, hypothetical moon found by William Pickering, or supposedly found by William Pickering. He'd got it on a number of plates. Um, now, Pickering sort of pedigree here because he's actually found the ninth moon of Saturn, which is Phoebe. Um, but the claim hasn't been um, confirmed by others, so I'll just skip over this because of the time. Um, but from the readings he got, he was able to compute an orbit and he actually won a prize, his discovery of the ninth, which does exist, and the tenth satellites of Saturn. So again, maybe it's one of these much smaller solar system objects that he's captured on his, um, on his plates. So Themis does not exist, but you know, if you look in astronomy books from, you know, not so many decades ago, you, you could very well see it listed. Well, Planet X. Now, Planet X. I'm referring here to um, planets beyond Neptune. So this harks back to the days really before Pluto was discovered, because you know, once Neptune had been discovered, people were looking for other planets beyond uh, Neptune. And we were given the title really of Planet X. And, you know, Clyde, sorry, Percival Lowell was one of the people that um, instigated searches. Uh, um, and, you know, you can read up all about that, all the various searches that people did take place in um, before Pluto was discovered. I'm not going to say anything else about that. Um, Nemesis. Well, this is a hypothetical star in what you know orbiting the sun but you know beyond the uh, main boundary of the Oort cloud and it's been proposed it could be a red dwarf or a brown dwarf so that's why it's why it's difficult to see and this has been put forward to try and explain the approximate 30 million year cycles of mass extinction that um, some people think can be recognized in the geological record so it's regular interactions with the Oort cloud we send loads of comets in towards the Earth, increasing the chance of an impact. Um, but no brown dwarf in the solar system has been identified even by WISE, so unlikely. Um, so there's the um, Oort, Oort cloud there. Now, what about Planet Nine? Um, this is obviously a more recent um, proposal. And in fact, I think it's fair to say over the last two to three decades, our knowledge of the solar system beyond Neptune has expanded rapidly. And it's become clear that we find objects out there that have very long, highly inclined orbits. And one of these is, of course, the uh, famous Sedna. Um, but how could this be explained? How could that orbit like that be explained? maybe um, it had an encounter with a massive body or not a known planet in the solar system, maybe another star that wandered a bit too close to the sun. And, you know, similar objects have been discovered. And in 2016, uh, Batygin and Brown, um, they found, um, or they've suggested that a bias in the objects of some of these um, extreme trans-Neptunian objects, so some of these on here, could possibly ex be explained by Planet Nine, um, a massive um, unseen, as yet undiscovered body, uh, way out beyond uh, Neptune. And um, they calculated all sorts of data for it, data question mark, because uh, you know the orbital periods between 10 and 20,000 years, well, that narrows it down a bit, doesn't it? Semi-major axis, hundreds of astronomical units. It's got an eccentric orbit, highly inclined, five to 10 times the mass of the Earth, um, two to four times the radius of the Earth. 
and you know people are actively searching for this so we shall see or maybe not they have actually um or proposed various um orbits for it and um between 1000 AD and 3000 AD, one of these possibilities is that it could be found in this region of the, the sky here, um, you know, heading up towards Orion. That's when it's at, at helium. But um, the fact that it's one possible orbit, well, as I said, we'll just have to wait and see. But other explanations have been put forward for the clustering of these TNOs. But I want to believe in Planet Nine, that is. I think someone ought to redo that poster and instead of the flying saucer, please put Planet Nine uh, on there. Okay. So just very briefly, just to put some ideas in your head, uh, you know, what else have people, um, you know, said has existed over the years and has turned out not to? Or what else are people looking at? Well, Martian canals, dark matter, dark energy, flat Earth. And I'm sure a lot of people in this audience will be very familiar with this. Can you speak Venusian? Um, there's the book, isn't it? There? And there was, um, I think, the old Sky at Night, which is on YouTube. And um, I think, you know, Patrick was very, you know, generous in this when he described these people as independent thinkers, um, which a lot of these are. And I think the world needs people like this, doesn't it? To, um, um, you know, these, these independent thinkers. But I think also sometimes people have to, you know, step back sometimes. When they realise that the evidence mounts uh, against them, and um, so hopefully I've um, encouraged you to perhaps go away and find out about some of these hypothetical objects yourself. There are a lot more, uh, believe me. So thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you, Anne, for a fascinating talk. Shall I stop sharing or? Uh... Um, you can do it. Up to you as to... Uh, okay, I'll stop sharing, yeah. Okay. And great to see the historical context because, yes, we've heard sort of of sort of all the sort of the recent ones, but it puts it in sort of to see it through history as to how those um, ideas have sort of come come into sort of favour and then waned again. Um, for the attendees, if you'd like to ask a question, um, you can do that in Zoom using the Q&A which will normally appear at the bottom of your screen and on YouTube if you want to type into the comments. Um, and please see we've got about 75 to 80 people joining us today across Zoom and YouTube. Um, and just whilst we wait for any questions, um, just to let everyone know that our next webinar is going to be on Wednesday the 10th of February at 7pm. It's going to be about the astronomer Vera Rubin uh, presented by Dr. Jacqueline Mitten. Uh, not a question, but I see that Horst Meerdirks has um, said that hell in German means bright. Yeah. It's a good name. Yeah, I, I did know it meant something sort of fairly complimentary in German, but um, I'd forgotten what it meant. And I was just putting a very sort of uh, Anglo-centric uh, uh, view on things. So thank you very much, Horst. I will remember that. Thank you. Yes. So, yes, that does show him in a, a better light, I suppose, if you excuse the pun. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had, um, thanks for an excellent talk from Gerard um, Matenga. Excuse me, my pronunciation. Matengart. Um, and just want to wait to see if there are any questions. I mean, one one thing I, I did remember seeing the sort of the more recent um, ideas for sort of the planet nine, explaining the the orbits of the uh, trans-Neptunian objects, and it seemed very promising at the time. But yeah. then I think they they have done sort of searches, and thus far, it's shown up nothing. And they, I think probably they've, they've they've done some pretty deep surveys, haven't they? Mm. Yes, I think they have. I mean, I was just looking at this again uh, yesterday, and um, as of earlier on this month, they they reported that they haven't found anything. So it is uh, quite you know current. And um, um, I mean, one of the suggestions they've put forward is, a, or, or not, well, not the, the Batigan and Brown, but um, other people have put forward is a primordial black hole. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but um, hmm. who knows? Um, yeah. Is, um, you know, strange. Was it? 
uh, JBS Haldane, you know, once said the universe is not only queerer than we imagine, it is queerer than we can imagine. And I think, yes. you know, particularly with some of these um, explanations that people come up, I think that's uh, very valid. Uh, and we have a, uh, a comment from Stephen Brown saying, excellent talk, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, and, and also, I think it kind of reminds me as well, is um, with the sort of change in astronomy of recent times, with the discovery of extrasolar planets, and how they have to sort of have at least three, or I think maybe even sometimes five observations of a transit before they actually take it seriously as, okay, yes, they've discovered a, a, a planet orbiting another star. But I think these days, if um, you, you know, people were just going on sort of one observation, it would be so much easier for, you know, discovery like that to sort of get around the world. And then, um, you know, I think this is where the sort of like hoaxes and conspiracies uh, could take it because we live in a world that's very much um, geared towards that at the moment, I believe, don't we? You know, even solid science, um, people want to try and um, criticise or read something else into it. Yes, and actually, I'm pleased to see we're starting to get a few questions come in now as, as people okay. get typing. So this is from Andy Jones of Breckland Astronomical Society. He says, great talk. Um, with the mathematics of the orbits of the ETNOs, such as Sedna, leading itself to the potential existence of Brown's Planet Nine, Planet Nine seems to be our current Vulcan. Is it more likely to be discovered or will mathematics destroy the Planet Nine theory much as Einstein did for Vulcan? Well, um, I assume that, um, you, you know, with the, the sort of Planet Nine, they're, they're throwing all, all the maths we, we've got at, at it. Um, whereas um, ov obviously with, um, you know, Vulcan, um, poor old um, Leverrier, um, you know, didn't have um, that sort of magic ingredient of sort of Einstein to sort of work with. Um, I, I mean, I think they found some other objects as well as the sort of original six that have got that sort of bias in their um, orbit. Um, but as I said, people are starting to sort of put forward some other theories as, as well. And um, I must admit, I'm not too up on, on those. So, um, but it would certainly be something that um, would be worth uh, looking into. And I think that, um, you, you know, people are keeping, you know, quite an open mind um, ab about this. Um, I think it's a bit like, you know, the recent announcement about the, um, you know, discovery of phosphine on, on Venus. Um, you know, that, that was announced. And, um, but then I think, you know, they've sort of drawn back from that a bit, haven't they? Um, so I think that, um, and, and sometimes when people make discoveries, I don't know if you remember a few years ago, was it an Italian team that claimed to have found, was it neutrinos that were traveling faster than light? And they knew something was wrong with this and they deliberately put it out there so that other people could have a look at it and essentially tell them where they're going wrong. So um, I'm not sure if that answers the, uh, the, the previous uh, question. Um, but yeah, it may well be that Planet Nine is the, uh, the modern day equivalent of Vulcan. Um, but I. I'd love it to exist, but um, as I said, uh, perhaps that's the agent Mulder in me. <laughs> yes, and, and it is how science works. You put out your ideas and then yes. they've either shot down or else corroborating yes. evidence comes mm. forward. That's right, yeah. And we have a, some, a question from Bill Tarver. Um, existence of Planet Nine is suggested by 15 or so arguments of perihelia. How many more will need to prove, provoke a wider search? Uh, I'm afraid I don't know that actually. Um, I, 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 I don't know. Um, I suspect that, um, you know, like a lot of these things, the more data that you can get, um, the better it is. But um, I, um, I, I really don't know, sorry. And then we have a question from Peter Carson. Um, small bodies do occasionally get trapped in Earth orbit for short periods. So could this be what Barnard observed? Maybe, it, it could very well be, couldn't it? As I said, there's no other um, you know, explanation that we know of. It certainly wasn't a star. And obviously it's well over a hundred years ago now, but yeah, it could, could be. 
Um, then we have uh, Richard Miles, and he says, thank you for a comprehensive and authoritative account, especially Vulcan. Can you say what your sources of the historical information were? Have you thought about writing this all up? Maybe you've already done this. Uh, no, I, I haven't um, uh, written it up. Um, my sources. Um, yeah, I did actually start yesterday putting a slide with the sources up because I thought I, I should do that. Um, but this this talk has been in um, existence in one form or another for sort of quite a few years now. And um, maybe I've lost some of the, the sources, but um, essentially I, I've just got most of this off, off the internet, quite honestly. But if anyone did want a list of sources, I could put one two together, yes. Yes, it's kind of, um, the internet has transformed how, uh, how, how research can now be done. Oh, indeed, yes. Um, but again, it's so easy, you know, you get stuff on the internet that um, uh, how much faith can you have in it? And, um, um, you know, one source says, you know, you look up three internet sources, you get four different uh, <laughs> explanations or four different pieces of data, don't you? So you do have to be a bit uh, uh, selective. Yes, it's, it's important to be sceptical. Yes. And not a question, but a comment from Martin Berger. Uh, a comment on the detail of Mercury's orbit. As Jean Muse points out in More Maths, Astro Morsels, many people quote the 43 degrees as the absolute value. The 43 degrees is the excess. The longitude of perihelion increases by 572 degrees per century relative to a fixed equinox or 5603 degrees. Oh, sorry, um, it's my, I was thinking that was a big number. It's me um, looking at small things on my screen. I mean, 43 seconds is the excess and longer per perihelion increases by 572 seconds per century relative to a fixed equinox or 5603 seconds for the moving vernal equinox. And apologies, Martin, for my mispronunciations in uh, looking at the small things on my screen. I'll have to do a bit of looking up about that then. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Martin. And I can't see any questions coming in on YouTube yet. So if there are no more questions, we'll get ready to switch over to um, David Arditi for the Sky Notes. Um, but once again, I'd like to thank Anne for her... Uh, coming and giving us this uh, fascinating and um, informative talk today. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for listening, everyone, and stay safe, okay? Thank you. Thanks. And hello, David. Hello, <clears throat> Andrew and uh, Anne. Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for excellent talk, Alan and uh, Anne, and thanks for putting ideas into the heads of our members. I, I think I can say that our members do not need much encouragement to think independently, we've got quite a bit of independent thought anyway. So um, uh, glad to see there's quite a few people on the call today and hope you're all keeping well. I've uh, been very busy. I seem to be on these uh, Zoom and similar things rather a lot. Just yesterday, I was on an SPA podcast uh, trying to increase the rapprochement between the BAA and the SPA, a, a venture I know our current president approves of. And I was talking there uh, about uh, the relationship between music and space or music and astronomy. So uh, you can still catch that on the uh, uh, SPA Facebook page if you're interested in that particular extravaganza. Uh, but uh, on to more serious things, our recent observations and what's going on in the sky at the moment. So uh, I will sh share the empty desktop and uh, then uh, you should be able to see the uh, title slide for my sky notes 2021 january uh, many of you will know me as a, a planetary observer and concerned with things in the solar system but today i will uh, confound your expectations by starting with a discussion of variable stars yes 
variables. No longer will they be consigned to the outer reaches of Sky Notes and only dealt with in virtually a footnote at the end or even not at all. No, today I will uh, give you a lot of variable stars. And this is perhaps the most famous variable of all. Uh, certainly one of the brightest, Alpha Orionis de Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse. Uh, here's some recent observations that uh, the variable star section have collected on Betelgeuse. Last winter, we witnessed a, a fade, uh, which got a lot of publicity and people said, is it going to explode? Uh, well, it's probably not going to explode because it was probably just due to an outpouring of dust, uh, partially obscuring it. Uh, it remained very bright in infrared, which is evidence for that view. It's recovered. It's uh, disappeared uh, during the summer, uh, but it's currently quite bright. It's currently magnitude 0.6 and uh, it shows continuous variations and uh, Dr. Mark Kidger, who's written about this in the BAA Journal, and also we had a webinar specifically about this some time ago uh, from him, he says there is a possible 430 day period. And uh, on the basis of that, we can expect another minimum uh, around April the 12th, 2021. So look out for that. This is a thing that we can all observe without optical aid. and. Uh, just in case you don't know what it looks like, here's uh, the stars in the vicinity. This is one of the variable star section charts, and I always invert these when I display them, make black white, so that they're not too offensive on the eye in a presentation that consists mainly of astronomical images. Uh, but there you've got the comparison stars, and so this is a simple example. This shows how visual variable star observing exactly how it works, how you have this sequence of comparison stars. One of them is Bellatrix, one of them is Pollux, one of them is Capella. They're obviously all close, first, close to first magnitude and not too blue. They, ne they need to be on the red side of the spectrum to reliably compare with Betelgeuse. And you've got the magnitudes of the comparison stars there. And so you look at them all and try and judge uh, which one Betelgeuse is comparable to. And uh, you can do magnitude estimates visually to 0.1 of a magnitude after you get used to it. And so this is a thing that we can all try and do. Another variable star that's easy to observe is Algol, famous eclipsing binary system. The eclipses last 10 hours uh, with a period of 69 hours. And uh, tonight we've got uh, mid eclipse at a convenient time, 10 p.m. And that eclipse ends at 3 a.m. So if you've got clear skies tonight, you should be able to get a clear comparison of the minimum with the maximum of Algol. There's another good opportunity on January the 26th. And um, Jeremy, director of the variable star section, tells me that the main aim is just to encourage non-variable star observers to wander at this event. We won't discover anything new. This has been understood for a long time what's going on here, uh, but uh, wander at the event. And there it is, there's the, uh, there's Algol in the constellation Perseus and the chart, which you will be able to find on the BAA variable star pages. So here's something new. This is a, a nova that's been discovered, uh, Nova Persei, and uh, also known as V1112 Perseus. It's uh, discovered on November the 25th uh, it, it reached eighth magnitude, it's fallen back and been fading quite fast recently. And here's a, a spectrum taken by Mike Harlow in the lower part of the image. And he took that uh, with his 12 inch astrograph and with a 26 centimeter objective prism, which originally I think came from the BIA instrument collection and quite an interesting and uh, historic bit of kit there. Objective prisms not very often used for spectroscopy these days. Uh, you More usually you have a, a grating at the eye end of the telescope, but the use of an objective prism, that is uh, an interesting uh, old method of doing these observations. And it's good that um, 
he Mike has applied this to this object. Here's the curve of the brightness of Nova Perseus. So observations of this are encouraged. Obviously, it's a telescopic object. And here's the data from combined from the BAA and also the American Association of Variable Star Observers and elsewhere. Further out in the universe, we have a supernova. This is a supernova, very recent discovery, 2021 AAI in NGC 2268. Uh, it's faint, uh, 17th, 18th magnitude. And I just want to mention that this is a, such a great example of how uh, well-equipped and on the ball BAA serious observers can jump on these things so quickly. It was discovered on January the 12th uh, from using the Palomar 1.2 meter Osrin Schmidt telescope at 0749 UT. And Nick James was already on the case that same day at 2146 UT getting a confirmatory image and magnitude estimate. And um, uh, other, other BAA members were already on that day discussing it and uh, trying to, uh, discussing it on the BAA website forum and trying to even trying to obtain spectra of it. I don't know if they succeeded because it was a very difficult object being so close to the galactic nucleus. So uh, well done them. Uh, and it just shows how amateurs can leap on these things and uh, provide these observations very soon after the discovery, these professional discoveries. I'll now mention some more objects that vary in the distant sky. Uh, we have uh, Hubble's Variable Nebula. There are quite a few, well, there are not a lot. There is a small handful of nebulae which are known to be variable and they're associated generally with variable stars and with young stars that are uh, illuminating surrounding dust, which they have not yet, which their solar winds have not yet cleared out of their neighborhood. And uh, this is NGC 2261, Hubble's Variable Nebula, and a lovely picture by Richard Sargent. And Richard has been taking a whole series of excellent images of the known variable nebulae recently, and I'll show a few of his images. Here's uh, Heinz Variable Nebula. And uh, this is one that I hadn't heard of before, Tom's Nebula or Tommy's Nebula, all by Richard. So the BIA has a project to observe these and there are some new pages on the Deep Sky section uh, website uh, listing these objects and uh, giving links to the information about them and uh, latest observations about them. So well-known ones are Heinz and Hubble's Variable Nebula, McNeil's Nebula, and a lot of them well-placed this time of year. Taurus, Monoceros, Orion, they're well-placed. Uh, with The Corona Australis one, obviously, we can't see from the UK, uh, but all the others we can. And the, then there's the one which nobody can pronounce very well, Gilbadagian's Nebula. And there's a couple of new ones listed down there as well. Uh, one in the vicinity of NGC 1333 in Perseus, and another one associated with V347 Origai. And the, these have been uh, turned up by Grant Privet. And uh, so these are new or re suspected objects, suspected variable nebulae, which we're encouraging particularly observations of. And here's another image from Richard Sargent showing NGC 1333, this new suspected very small bit of variable nebulosity, and the one in Origa, V347 Origae. If you want to see these objects, obviously, you need a telescope, and uh, the uh, most of the observations we receive are taken with monochrome cameras, and it, ideally you need dark skies, and to get dark skies you need to know what the moon is doing, so uh, I'll tell you about the moon phases. We're coming up to uh, a full moon now, and uh, next new moon will be February the 11th. 
uh, February the 19th is the next first quarter. That will be a very high first quarter moon. So that would be a good one to observe. Uh, next full moon after that, February the 27th. New moon again on the 13th of March and an even higher first quarter moon, an even better place on March the 21st. So that's information you need if you're looking at the deep sky to avoid the full moons, or if you want to look at the moon, of course, uh, then uh, the coming months will be a very good time to look at the growing crescent moon. And you can also observe in that connection lunar occultations. And I'll highlight a couple of occultations of uh, brightest stars in the next few weeks. February the 1st, there's an occultation of Nu Virginis, magnitude 4, and it will be reappearing at the dark limb of the moon uh, at a, a reasonably convenient time of the night, well, 1.37 in, on February the 1st. And uh, another one, uh, similar brightness, a uh, star in Cancer, Gamma Cancri or Acillus Borealis, and that disappears at the dark limb of the moon. And uh, that's on February the 25th. And later that night, it will reappear at the bright limb. The planets Jupiter and Saturn were attracting a lot of attention recently because they were in close conjunction. And the conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn happens about every 20 years. But this was a particularly close one. And here is a picture I got with uh, Jupiter and Saturn and the moon there and Earthshine on December the 17th. And the closest approach of Jupiter and Saturn was the 21st when they were only five arc minutes separation. So within the field of a small telescope, uh, still splittable with the naked eye but really very close and um, so close that we won't see that again in our lifetimes. Uh, there will be another uh, five minute apart in about 60 years time, but it will be in the daytime sky. So it won't be well placed from the UK. So if you missed it this time, uh, you missed it, I'm afraid. And I kind of missed it because it was cloudy during the, completely cloudy on the 21st. Uh, but, uh, the 20th was okay uh, from St Albans and I'll show you Martin Lewis's marvellous image here and this he tells me was just one exposure well it's it's a webcam exposure so it's many exposures but it's just it's just one length of exposure and he's only done a, a gamma adjustment to uh, bring up the fainter Saturn in relation to Jupiter but it's not a composite uh, so that's really quite an achievement to get Jupiter and Saturn on the same frame and it's not a composite and he took that, um, uh, he went to great lengths, he had put his telescope on like a table or an elevated platform about one metre up, so he put a, an eight inch Dobsonian telescope on a platform to see over his garden fences and so forth to capture that lovely view. And we've had a lot of lovely views of that event from various parts of the world. Here's the view uh, that Chris Go got from Cebu in the Philippines. And you can see even there the great red spot on Jupiter looking, looking very, very, very dark. And uh, another example from another part of the world from Curacao. Uh, this is uh, Eric Sushenbach, another of our correspondents and great observers, great overseas observers, and another lovely image uh, showing the satellites of Saturn almost intermingled with the moons of Jupiter. And this is uh, quite remarkable, I think, worth highlighting that Peter Anderson in Queensland, he observed this and here's his image, and uh, he's a big contributor to my section, the uh, instruments and equipment section of reviewing equipment and so forth. But what's remarkable here is that he also observed a similar event in 1961. And here's his picture of the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in 1961, taken with a fixed camera on film, obviously one minute exposure, and he's got a six inch telescope in the foreground uh, so that uh, that wasn't as close as the recent one. That was about 16 
arc minutes. So re reasonably close, but not as close as, as the conjunction we've just had. But I think that's a remarkable record, 60 years nearly of observing Jupiter, Saturn, conjunctions. I, I doubt whether anybody else has done that. So that, uh, that day it was cloudy for me and then for the next few nights it was cloudy but eventually I managed to see them in the same telescope field and I, I couldn't get them on my colour camera which has a smaller chip but I managed to take one picture in um, monochrome uh, and uh, this was taken with a four inch refractor and that was December the 24th three days after the closest approach, but I could still get them visually in the field of the four inch refractor and it was well worth seeing. And uh, I got that image, which, and that image actually is a composite of different exposures for Saturn and Jupiter, because there's a big brightness difference. And I, I was able to follow Jupiter into the sunset. Saturn has now gone into the sunset, but I got a bit obsessed with taking pictures of Jupiter very low down seeing how close I could get to the conjunction. And here's one taken on January the 9th and there's Jupiter just disappearing into the sunset. Saturn has already disappeared. So what are the planets doing in the near future? Here's the list. Mercury has a greatest eastern elongation, so it's in the western sky. And uh, that's January the 24th. And uh, on January the 28th, it has its maximum separation is a maximum altitude at sunset. So this is a quite a good occasion to observe Mercury from the UK. Venus is uh, too close to the sun to observe. Mars is still prominent in the evening sky, much faded, uh, much reduced in size from opposition, uh, but it's uh, well placed in the evening sky and high up, 53 degrees high. Jupiter has now disappeared and conjunction is January the 29th. Uh, Saturn is now in conjunction with the sun tomorrow. Uranus is still visible as an evening object close to Mars transiting 6 p.m. And uh, Neptune is disappearing into the evening twilight. Now it's only 24 degrees high at 6 p.m. So you probably won't catch Neptune again. Here's uh, where Mercury will be uh, when it's at its maximum uh, elevation above the horizon, 28th of January. And I've already had one image of Mercury, uh, image captured by Pete Lawrence on the 21st, just a couple of days ago. So well done. If you want to look at Mercury with a telescope, best to do it in the daytime when it's a bit higher. And Planetary images can get quite good results on Mercury these days. And here's uh, a contributor in Italy, Luigi Moroni, and he's uh, made something, a, a specialization, taking pictures of Mercury. And on the left, there's a simulated image based on spacecraft data. And on the right, there is his image. And this was taken in November. And you can see there's a good correspondence between the brighter patches on Mercury and some of the, that he's imaged and some of the brighter ray craters and um, higher albedo areas. In the night sky, there's a few close approaches of uh, planets. Mars and Uranus are only two degrees apart tonight. That's where they are in Aries, just south of Aries. And uh, on February the 17th, the moon will make a close approach to Uranus, three degrees apart. February the 17th, and then on February the 18th, Mars and the Moon will be five degrees apart. And then the end of February, about the 28th of February, Mars is close to the Pleiades, three degrees apart, so not a telescope field, but you'll get them nicely in the field of binoculars, and it could be quite picturesque. We can still observe Mars telescopically, of course, I've been continuing to take images of it, Here's one from January the 9th showing Sinus Meridiani, that fork-shaped feature on the, on the meridian. The uh, north, the south polar cap, which would be at the top, hardly visible now, really shrunken. Here's an image from Martin Lewis, even more recent, 15th of January. 
and the, the polar caps are virtually gone there. The polar hood is uh, at the other end, the bottom end of Mars. Uh, that's a cloud hood. But now this season of the Martian year, we get a reversal and we start to see the north polar cap and correspondingly clouds develop over the south polar regions. And uh, some of the very latest images might be showing that now, although I, I couldn't find a good example, but uh, that will be observable. Although Mars is very shrinking now uh, and it's, uh, it's down to, it was in this image, it's down to nine seconds diameter. From Martin Lewis's observations through this whole apparition, he's produced this lovely map of Mars. And here's the labeled version of it. So a lot of dedication and really serious imaging effort has gone into producing that. Minor planets, uh, we've got uh, Vesta coming to our position on 3rd of March, that's in Leo, magnitude 6.2, so only just below naked eye visibility. Uh, Jupiter is now invisible, uh, but here's a map based on observations by BAA members on November in November. And you can see, interestingly, the equatorial regions have had this very bright orange coloration, quite unusual. Great red spot, very small there. We'll have to see how all that develops when Jupiter comes out from the sun next uh, later this year. Uh, Clyde Foster. Uh, observing from South Africa has managed to follow Jupiter as late as January, as late as December the 26th. Here's his image of Jupiter with his spot, Clyde Spot, which that's an unofficial name, which is even being used by the uh, professional uh, planetary scientists now to describe this feature. And uh, of course, he's been collaborating closely with the Juno mission. Juno had a perijove on December the 30th, it's 31st Perijove. And uh, here's uh, one of the images. Uh, I'm not sure who um, processed this image. It was probably uh, John Rogers uh, or um, uh, one of his collaborators. Uh, looking further out, well, Martin Lewis has again come up trumps with uh, images of uh, Uranus and Neptune. Here's Uranus and its moons from 5th of November. And the same night, Neptune and Triton, both taken with his 444 millimeter home built Dobsonian. That's, that's about an 18 inch telescope. And you can get the, you can see, because it's the same system, you get good idea of the relative apparent sizes of those two planets. There they are. And every year, Martin produces a parade of the planets from all his observations in that actual year. He didn't manage to get Mercury this year, but he's got all the others. So splendid work there. Moving rapidly on to the comets. The comets uh, are not produ producing a great show at the moment. They're all faint. They're all of 10th, 11th, 12th magnitude. Uh, Mac Holtz, early evening. Uh, an Atlas comet, which is visible all night, uh, and uh, a linear comet uh, fading best evening. Uh, then uh, there's this uh, new one, 2021A2 Neowise is magnitude 12. It's not visible from the UK, but it's moving north and will be visible at the end of this month. So we want to try and catch that. And it it's, seems to be brightening. It probably won't get much brighter, only magnitude brighter, but that will be visible. And this other new one, 2021A1, the first one to be discovered this year, Comet Leonard, discovered by Greg Leonard on Mount Leonard Observatory. And that's been attracting some interest. It could be bright. Uh, it's very far out at the moment, but uh, we have a whole year to watch it. It's coming in. It's currently in Bootes, uh, and it was observed by um, Nick James just the other night in Boatis, uh, and uh, he, he said it was about magnitude 19. Uh, but it could get, um, and this is always a hostage to fortune and bound to fail, virtually bound to fail, but it could get to about fourth magnitude in December because it has a close approach to the Earth. 
0.2 AU from the Earth and uh, only 0.03 AU from Venus. So Venus is the place to go to see Comet Leonard. It could well be the best comet of the year. It will be in the northern sky for a long time, either in Boötes or in Ursa Major. So observations of that are encouraged. Here's an observation by Peter Carson using a remote telescope in Spain. And that's what Leonard is like at the moment. It's insignificant speck. Here's uh, some, a couple of the other comets I mentioned. Here's uh, 2020 M3 Atlas imaged by Peter Tickner from Berkshire uh, and a uh, nice greenish comet there, 7th of November. And here's an image from uh, the indefatigable Martin Mobley, who images so many comets. This is uh, 156P Russell, uh, November the 15th. And uh, that's uh, another greenish looking comet and some deep sky objects in there, ARP 295, which is a peculiar galaxy just below the comet there. I'll tell you about this uh, near Earth object, close approach, uh, called 1999 RM45. March the 2nd to 3rd will be the time to look out for. You can't, won't be able to use this map because it'll be moving so fast, but it will be well placed. Early in the evening on um, March 1st and 2nd, it will um, be in, uh, in the Monoceros to Orion area but you'll need to get precise predictions that will be moving fast, uh, which you can get those precise predictions from the Minor Planet Center of Harvard University. Uh, it passes 7.6 lunar distances from the Earth and it will uh, still be quite faint, magnitude 13.4. Other objects that approach, well, even closer to the Earth, in fact, collide with it, are of course meteors. We had a famous meteor shower, the Quadrantids, recently, but it, here from my observatory, it was completely cloudy. I haven't seen much reports of observations from the UK. We had a cloudy period, but radio observers can do this. And uh, here's a correspondent of mine, uh, a friend of mine in the West of London Astronomical Society, David Talaber, who's uh, been doing the observations. And here's a observation of a quadranted meteor in this trace at the lower right. It makes this bit of noise um, as it burns up over southern France. It passes through the beam of a military radar uh, called the Graves radar and that refracts um, some of the radio waves uh, back and it can be picked up in the UK. And so this is the technique that is used, uh, this uh, fractional ref reflection of the ionized region of the atmosphere that the meteor creates. And so radio observers can gather very useful data about these meteor showers when the meteors are not actually visible because it's too cloudy. There was a recently a very well heralded but much missed eclipse because most people couldn't go to South America to see it, but a a small party of intrepid explorers did, they got permission. And this is one of the most spectacular images I've ever seen of an eclipse or any astronomical object. This is collaboration between um, Andreas Muller and Miloslav Druckmuller. I think they are from the Czech Republic. And they were on the same trip uh, that uh, Nick James and um, Mike Frost, uh, BIA members were on and uh, uh, Andreas and Miloslav produced this marvelous image which shows this tremendous coronal disturbance on the left due to a, a solar flare uh, disturbing the very visibly the magnetic field lines there and there's a comet there as well there's a sun grazing comet just in the lower left of that picture and you can really see it looks a bit red so yeah, that we, we've discovered Vulcan again. And maybe that's what explains some of these observations of Vulcan-like objects in the past. I think it's quite likely. Maybe they were comets, because that's what you see during a solar eclipse. And uh, a comet has been captured there. 
uh, in this particular view, but uh, Nick James was also imaging around the area for comets. And in this composite of data from Nick James, Milosla and um, Andreas Muller, pr processed by Milosław Druckenmuller, you can see uh, the comet uh, C2020 Soho, that little red one, and another one much further out, a greenish one, S uh, C2020 S3 Erasmus, and uh, Nick James captured that comet. He also captured the, the other one and most of the data in this image, and uh, just the, the inner corona and uh, the image of the moon was uh, superposed on that in this composite by uh, Miloslav Druckmuller. So uh, that's a, a marvelous collaboration there. And uh, they did very well to get there and have, have a marvelous view of that eclipse. I haven't mentioned the sun itself. Uh, obviously it's not a thing we observe much in the winter in the UK, but um, it, it's showing some activity and uh, Gary Palmer, uh, Deputy Director of uh, my equipment and techniques section. He has been imaging the sun regularly and his, his image from January the 21st, a uh, hydrogen alpha image taken with a Daystar quark filter. And there you can see a little sunspot pair and um, a solar flare, I suppose it is, or some, some kind of small thing like small flare there. Uh, so a little bit of activity, the sun's activity is picking up. I thought I'd show you some things now, which are not BAA observations, but uh, really um, spectacular images which came my way. Here's uh, a thing which at first I thought was an artwork, either, either, either a rediscovery of something that Van Gogh painted or uh, some uh, liberties that somebody has taken with a national call image using Photoshop. But no, this is indeed a scientific image. And this was a astronomical picture of the day a few days ago, M51 uh, with magnetic field lines, magnetic field lines. And those can be surmised from IR polarization measurements by the NASA Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, SOFIA. They've, all, they've always got good acronyms these things haven't they so uh, and and they've discovered that the magnetic field lines uh, don't necessarily go along the spiral arms of the galaxies they can um, have these fishbone patterns and uh, this has got the, a complicated structure suggesting uh, the magnetic field of the galaxy is being influenced by the collision it's having with this uh, minor galaxy up the top there and even more spectacular even further out in the much further out in the universe this was announced and I learned this in the um, SPA broadcast yesterday, actually. So I just put it in. It was announced at the January 21st meeting of the American Astronomical Society. Artist's impression, and this is artist's impression, and this has been discovered, Quasar J03, not one, J0313 stroke 1806. And it is a thousand times more luminous than the Milky Way biggest quasar, earliest quasar, uh, only 60, 670 million years in, after the Big Bang, the earliest known supermassive black hole, 1.6 billion solar masses. Uh, so uh, some incredible details there. The wind outflows at 20% of the speed of light. Uh, 10 trillion times more luminous than, than our sun, it says here. A thousand times more luminous than the Milky Way, the most distant quasar to date. That's nearly all. I'll just point you to uh, excellent work that our BAA website team have been doing, putting new features on our website. And this is marvelous. I've, I've run out of time here. I was going to sh show you this, uh, but you can, uh, uh, there's lots of new features. And uh, if you submit your images to the BAA website by having your, your profile, your membership profile on there, they can be put into a database which actually allows them to be uh, searchable. And uh, there's lots of interesting features to that. Uh, yeah, there it is. Lots of interesting features. And uh, you can, um, I can actually demonstrate this directly. Uh, 
you you can get a sky map which actually shows you where the where these objects are because they've been plate solved. The, the software that um, Dominic Ford has been developing for our website actually solves the images for where they are in the sky. And then we put them all in a database and you can click on them and you can get an individual image and then for any part of the sky and you can overlay it with where the stars are and it will actually solve it. It will actually show you which it's not coming up now, but it will actually name the stars in the image. And uh, let's try try another one, see if we can get it to actually play it. Yeah, it actually solves it and names the objects and stars in the image. So uh, I think that's quite a unique tool that we've got our, at our disposal. So please do use it. Right, well, I've uh, run out of time now, so I'll... Um, hand back to Andy uh, and uh, see if we've got uh, any other questions or comments. And I'll stop sharing that. Great. Thank you very much, David. That was uh, a very informative Sky Notes and pleasing me to me see it start with the uh, variable stars, which are a great interest of mine. Yeah, I'm, I'm carrying favour there, I think. <laughs> with certain people. Um, I don't see any questions which are coming in. Um, once again, we've got the next webinar on Wednesday, the 10th of February at 7 p.m. The Astronomer Vera Rubin by Dr. Jacqueline Mitten. Um, if there are no questions coming in, then I'd like to once again thank Dr. Anne Bunnell for her fascinating talk and David Arditi for, for his very interesting sky notes and particularly linking in to the uh, talk on um, which given by Anne with the possibility of the, um, the comets, with the sun grazers, sun grazers, which you can see during a total eclipse. And uh, no, no question, but a, a comment from Stephen Brown saying very useful sky notes. Thank you. Good, good to know we're of some use. <laughs>